Okay, welcome to our April 10th, 2023 uh, work session meeting. We're going to let's see here. We're gonna start with the roll call, Kinsey. Smith. Here. Becker. Here. McCoy. Here. Leighton and Warren. Here. Welch. Here. Lyerly? Here. Mills? Here. Okay. Everyone's counted for. Um, joining us at the table tonight is uh, our newest board member, who is not official yet, but will be shortly when she's sworn in. Lynn Gerlach, welcome. And also, we're also joined by our um, inner city, inter city student council members. Can you please introduce yourselves? Good evening. My name is Macy Saha. I'm a senior at Preble, and I'm the president of ICSC. My name is Sydney Helgeson, and I'm also a senior at Green Bay Preble. Okay. Well, welcome. Feel free to please join in the discussion if you'd like. Okay, so um, the next thing on our agenda is the public forum. And we have a number of people who'd like to speak tonight. We're going to start in the order that we were, they were received. The very first um, person is um, Mr. Bendeley. Oh, we can come back. Yes, absolutely. All right, sure. Um, then the next person is Matt Albers. <laughs> All right. Okay, we've got other people, so we can come back to those people. Um, the next person is Karen Stips. Prefer not to stand for obvious reasons. <laughs> can you? Can you? Can that? <laughs> okay. Can oh, you pull okay. that? Yeah. That. All right. That's good. Thank yeah, you. We can hear you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, you have five minutes, and will you please state your name and your address? All right. My name is Karen Stibbs. I live at twenty six ninety Regina Street in Green Bay, and I am an employee of the Green Bay Schools for thirty eight plus years, a union member for thirty eight plus years, and also a member of the handbook committee that the district's been working with um, in both the large session and in the smaller session. And I'm just here this evening to um, voice my opinions about the proposal that you're all gonna be seeing tonight with regard to the vacation schedules, the changes and perhaps reductions to the vacation schedule for the hourly employees. I guess I'm having a hard time um, understanding that since the community task force just released last week the decision to choose option 12 to eliminate up to 12 uh, uh, educational areas or locations by combining or eliminating them all together, that um, this wouldn't create an employee reduction on its own just by this happening. Um, and also, with the fact that the district hired a, a third party company to come in just recently to evaluate the hourly employee job descriptions, wages, and anything else that would, uh, anything else in the study, just to make sure that we are on, on trend and on the market with uh, remaining competitive in the uh, greater Green Bay area. So with these two, these two things alone, I'm just, really not, it's kind of a cart before the horse kind of approach, in my opinion, to start talking about benefits to hourly employees and perhaps reductions to employee, uh, employee benefits 
when this might just automatically take care of itself. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Karen. Okay. Next, we have Christina Shelton. You have five minutes and state your name and address. Thank you. It's good to see you all. Hi, uh, Christina Shelton, 1045 South Webster Avenue. Um, I just want to take a moment to thank Dawn for her service on the Green Bay School Board. Thank you for being here, Dawn, and all you gave to our district. Uh, congratulations to Lynn and Laura um, on your election and your re-election. Uh, thank you to Vicki for leading us, and congratulations to the board on the successful hire of Dr. Tiller. We have a lot to celebrate, so thank you all for all that you do. Um, I come here tonight um, as a former school board member, as a mom with two kids in the Green Bay School District, and a former educator. Um, I was asked to be here tonight by my friend Ben DeLee and by the AFSCME members here tonight and in our district. Um, generally speaking, uh, I'm just a little bit concerned about some of the proposed changes to the vacation schedule for our district hourly employees. Uh, specifically as it relates to dropping the maximum days from 20, or I'm sorry, 30 to 25 and cutting those rollover days. Um, you know, our, our staff um, face uh, increased anxiety with uh, working conditions, pay and benefits across the state and across the country. I know the district and the board cares very deeply for our hourly employees, uh, but I am worried about the proposed benefit cuts um, and how it will hurt employee recruitment, retention, and employee satisfaction. Um, I have sp some specific concerns about equity across um, all district workers um, and specifically about long-term employment. So just ask tonight that you take into consideration uh, the feedback from AFSCME um, and uh, as you think about what that looks like on your vote in two weeks for the proposed changes for those folks. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, next is Tom Tedford. Welcome, could you just state your name and your address, please? Tom Tedford, 3416 Church Road, Green Bay, Wisconsin. Uh, I'm here tonight because I am a 36, a retired 36 year uh, veteran of the maintenance department here. Um, I would only know Mr. Becker, Mrs. Warren, um, the rest of you board members I've never met, never had the pleasure to meet. Um, I'm here tonight basically for talk on behalf of 3055, the employees that we represented. Um, <clears throat> I can tell you that any president of any local would not, not past, not present, not in the future, would agree to some of the, the cuts that are going to be made in this proposal from your management staff. Um, number one, if there was truly transparent collaboration, these wouldn't be pr presented to you in that manner. They would not. Um, I come back from a, a long time. I was instrumental in a lot of the language that was that's in that handbook. And hurts me deeply to see all the cuts and all the uh, slashing of them of the of that document it it just hurts me deeply all the man hours and woman hours that were put into that um, and again it 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 just should not go down like this um, I've been retired for nine years I was uh, the president of the local up to 2015 and when I left I thought that that handbook was pretty well put together. And at that time, I think there was pretty good collaboration between the representatives and, and the representatives here. Um, but apparently that is not the case. Uh, uh, number one, the vacation cuts that are proposed, you can't draw a line in the sand and say right here, at 20 years, we're going to change this. What about the guys that are and gals that are here for 19 and a half? They're going to be left behind. It's not fair. Uh, I think, if anything, that there needs to be more said about this and more work needs to be done. 
I'm asking the board at the very least, please table a lot of these proposals. There's some language about uh, uh, on, on snow days and early releases and stuff like that when, when inclement weather comes. One group is totally gonna be uh, told they gotta go stay. I mean, their safety means nothing. All staff and students get to leave except for one certain group. What about their safety? So I'm just here to say that there, there are a lot of things that there's a lot of loose ends that, that need to be tied up, you know, fixed. They're not correct. And I know for a fact, Mr. Becker knows what I'm talking about. We, we went through this. I went through this. Same discussion nine years ago. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Okay, next um, is um, Matt Elbers. I got a little handout for everyone. I don't know if I printed off 10, so I'm just showing the proposal in the current numbers. Okay, years of employment and, and the vacation numbers. I know it's probably in your books right now on your, in your computers, but quick reference. Okay. Hello. Mm. Oh, okay. Hello. My name is Matt Elbers, uh, 2701 Parkwood Drive. I've been employed here with the district for about 20 years now, and I am the, also the vice president of Ask Me Local 3055, which is the union uh, for the support staff here at the district. Uh, I'm here to talk to you guys about my concern for the new policy being proposed concerning our vacation language. First of all, my initial thoughts is, why is this being brought up now? This is not a budgetary issue. With all of the district's upcoming budget issues, redistricting, closing of schools, and all that goes on with that, I am just really questioning, why are you going after the employees again? We as employees are aware of the district's upcoming struggles when it comes to its budgets and its declining enrollment. And with that, even though it's financially hurts us as employees with the new health insurance plan that you guys just adopted, uh, most of us were aware that this needed to be done. And we realized, look, if we got to pay a little more to help our district, we can. But now there is another proposal that will definitely impact the employees and will hurt the employees that have been here the most. I'm gonna be going talking about uh, the 12 month employees right now because that's me, I'm, I'm a, a 12 month employee. So first of all, I work year round. I don't get summers off, which many people think we do out in the community. Oh, how was your summer off? What do you mean? I worked harder than ever. Uh, we don't receive a uh, spring break like teachers do. We all know that this is a very popular time to go on vacations with your family. So the week when a lot of people are off, we're here working. So we have to take vacation if we want to go somewhere. Uh, we don't receive a winter break. We only get the two days off at Christmas and the two days off at New Year's. So there's always been a couple of days in between that week that uh, I like to take off personally for my family for the holidays. Uh, so there's a couple extra days there too that I have to burn. And also several other days throughout the year uh, where staff are off, but the 12, 11, and 10 month em employees are required to be there. Uh, with that being said, we need more vacation time. Uh, you know, employees who receive these breaks, more we need more vacation time than, than the uh, employees who receive these breaks throughout the year. Uh, we also do not cost the district any additional money when we are off using a benefit day. All of our positions are covered or absorbed in house. No additional pay for a substitute is needed. So for example, if I take off, the job doesn't get done or someone fills in for me, but no sub is taken from off the street and paid a hundred and some bucks a day to cover for me. So if I'm off, nothing happens. Now, when looking at the current and proposed schedule, like I handed out uh, with the new proposal, we see that at year 15, you are already maxed out. Unlike the current one, it takes you 20 years to, to get to that 25 years, uh, 25 days. 
Now, I'm representing all of our union members, and for some, this will be a huge benefit for some of them because they're going to get days right away. They're going to get more vacation right away. But to the employees who have been here for longer than 15 years, this hurts. This will hurt. First of all, they will never get to their 30 days if they aren't in their 20th year as of now. Secondly, most employees work in the district. Most of us work in the district for 25, 30 sometimes even longer, probably longer. So after 15 years, half of your career, you will already max out your vacations. You're not going to get any more after your 15 years. And you have 30, you have 15 to 20 more to go. Where is the incentive to stay? Or where is the reward for your longevity in this district? In my opinion, this is way too fast of an accrual schedule. Finally, I'd like to address the 10 days rollover of vacation. Most of the people I know will never roll over 30 days of vacation, but I do know several that roll over, you know, double, you know, 10, 15, maybe 20. Me personally, I have 25 on the books right now, you know, and I have to till July 1st to use them. So I'll whittle away at it down uh, a couple more days here and there, of course. But I've been told that the district's budgets each year for everyone's vacation days. Yet if I don't use them all, where does that money go? Where does that money go if I don't use all my vacation? I said, as I said earlier, if I take a day off of work, the district absorbs my job internally and it does not cost them any money. I've also heard that the district's concerns about allowing people to have 30 days of vacation on the books is because when an employee retires, the district has to pay for all 30 days. Now, personally, I would like to see the actual numbers on this because I know a lot of people who are retiring right now and they're burning a lot of vacation. So I'd like to see how many days they actually have when they leave this place. So I guess in summary, I feel that the current vacation accrual schedule is working just fine. I feel it's fair to the new employees and, I also, and it also rewards those who have been here for a very long time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we have one more person. If anyone else wanted to speak, now would be a good time to submit your um, your paper. Other than, um, if there's no one else, then we have one more person, uh, Ben Lee. Want to state your name, please, and your address. I'm Bendeley, 1707 Boland Road, Green Bay. Um, I didn't get to print off what I was going to write about, so I had to put my whole laptop up. But um, I'm a father of three kids here in Green Bay. Uh, they all three go to chapel. But I'm not here to talk on that tonight. Um, I'm the president for Local 3055 for AFSME. Um, we are... We are dealing with a lot right now with everything that's changing um, between insurance, benefit changes, handbook changes. We're throwing a lot at our members right now. Matt covered a lot in his speech that I pretty much don't even need to touch on anymore. But um, I grew up in a very pro-labor family, a family that at a very young age, I was taught what benefits meant to an employee. Um, knowing... <laughs> That's the talk around the dinner table every night. My dad worked at the paper mill for 44 years, um, was the president of their union, and then went on to be the state vice president of every union for AFL-CIO. So I grew up in it. Um, it's important. The people here at the district value their, their benefits a lot. It was, you know, it was a hard situation with the insurance, but it was something that we knew we had to collaboratively work on. A change needed to happen. I didn't feel that that same return was happened with this. Um, I was pitched what, what the change was going to be. I'm also part of the handbook committee. So I was involved with it. Um, I spoke my piece quite frequently on it, but I felt like I was never heard. And tonight was the time that I wanted to get some of my members and myself out to talk about it. We, we hold these benefits very near to us. 
It's the reason why we have 25 and 30 year employees here at the district. Some of these people don't get that 30 days vacation until they're 25 years here, 25 years of service. And that's what we want to cut right now. We're more worried about a new employee coming in the door and incentivizing them, but cutting from the top. That's, I don't think that's right. So I, Matt pretty much covered everything I had to talk about, but I just, I really, I've taken the time to send you all a letter involving my stance on it and issues I had. And um, I would like you to take in consideration on supporting us in um, not supporting this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. That is uh, our, pub our um, public forum, the end of our public forum. So we're gonna move on to, uh, Thank you. The next on the agenda is um, recognition. Someone is leaving us tonight, Don Smith. And um, so we're gonna take a moment to recognize her service on the board. And while I was preparing for this meeting, um, I looked back at how she started her time on the board. It was, we're on the same election cycle. So we, we, um, we I had just been reelected and she was elected for the first time. It was right at the beginning of COVID. Um, and there was a great deal of uncertainty for all of us. Uh, no one really knew what to expect. And uh, it, it, it's at times like that, that it becomes really crucial to have solid people making decisions. And Don has proven to be that person. There were a lot of dark days and I knew I could always count on her to make the hard decisions with as much reasoned consideration and compassion as possible. So, um, so much of public service is pretty mundane and unexciting. So you want people on board who can look at the mundane and unexciting bits and understand that the systems that are in place um, allow a large organization like ours, uh, our district to function and deliver on its daily goal of a high quality education for all students. Don has always been that systems person. Um, it's something that I admire and respect about her um, not really being a systems person myself. Um, and I could always call her for solid advice and guidance, and I'm going to miss that. Sorry, <laughs> I thought I'd be able to make it through this. So um, so she's stepping away now and moving on to no doubt um, other missions of service, because I know that's part of her. Um, so I wanna thank you for your deep commitment to our district and to public education in general. And it's been a real pleasure to serve with you. To commemorate, oh, here. <laughs> um, let's see here, to commemorate that, we have a gift. And unfortunately, the gift hasn't arrived yet. <laughs> It did, well, actually, it did it, it. <laughs> it did it did arrive, but it was damaged and had to be repaired. So it is coming at like any moment now. Um, and but we do have a picture. Isn't that pretty? Um, this is the um, the artist is Joanna Galt. Uh, it's a watercolor colored pencil picture. And I'll just read the little description here. For this piece, I was a bit stumped for ideas at first, so I decided to go with something familiar. I recently did a digital painting of the same bridge and decided to reuse the setting with a different angle with watercolor. I did fairies on a little picnic date because I love fairies. My typical process for watercolor painting is to paint it and then add smaller details with colored pencil, such as fairies, tiny features, and I've been trying to out, 
I'm not sure what that word is, sorry, paint over the next few weeks. And for this painting, I used it for highlights and flowers. It turned out way better than I'd hoped. So that's, students? yeah, yeah, okay. Um, it, uh, that's her synopsis and her description of that painting. You know where she's a student? You know, uh, Kinsey DeWee. Just curious. Lori Blakesley. Do you know where the student is? A lovely picture. Yes, it is quite beautiful. So again, um, if you all just uh, join me in um, recognizing Dawn and her service to our district for the last three years. I'm going to make a very long speech. We're going to be here till 11 o'clock and it will be just like in 2020. <laughs> um, this work is so important. And I want to thank Lynn for stepping up. I ran in 2020 because um, I didn't like the other candidates that were running. And it, I just couldn't see somebody slide into the seat in the school board. The work is too important. And um, being here was never an aspiration for me. And I am so happy that Lynn stepped up and somebody that I felt would do a really good job stepped up. So I was able to step back. But... Um, it has been a huge learning and the work that all of you do is so important and I'm really privileged that I was able to be a part of it. So thank you. Good luck. Yeah. You all have some really, really hard work to do ahead of you and I will be thinking of all of you. Ooh, okay, we're going to move on in our agenda now. Um, Number three on the agenda is policy and governance. And um, let's see here, Melissa, uh, um, oh, that's right. Uh, Laura, you're gonna facilitate this. We're gonna, um, being joined at the board by Melissa Field Collar. Thank you. Um, we have um, recommendations for repeal of policy 221.1, rule two, administration benefits guidelines. We'll turn it over to Melissa. Good evening. We are recommending to repeal the rule that you have in front of you because we are able to incorporate almost all of the language into the uh, employee handbook. Those of us who have been here a little bit after Act 10, but longer than some others, believe that that rule exists because when there used to be collective bargaining agreements, that's where all the benefit language and the rules existed for employees who were covered by the collective bargaining agreements, but there was nowhere to put that language for administrators. So it was put into a, a rule in the board policies that described for administrators. Almost all of it is duplicative and the, the language that's not, we're able to roll now into the employee handbook so that we don't need to have a standalone rule where um, it could potentially be conflicting with the employee handbook. So we're recommending for it to be repealed in the language put in, in the employee handbook. Are there any questions? Andrew? Um, do we have... Um... Do we have a, a policy that states that the employee handbook is governed by board decisions only? Yes, we do. I believe it is in the 500 series. If it's not in the 500s, in the 100 series. Any other questions or comments? Thank you. We'll move on to um, letter B, which is the wellness policy. Federal law requires that the wellness policy be uh, reviewed every three years to ensure that it's up to date. And there's a number of factors in the policy that need to be looked at as to whether the policy needs to be updated. Um, I believe um, is Lynette, oh, Lynette is joining us tonight. She reviewed the policy along with Tim Flood to determine if the policy needed to be updated and they evaluated each of those factors and determined that the policy reflects the current work and is reflective of the goals that we're required to be working towards. So no changes. Thank you, any questions or comments? 
from the board. Thank you. You want to just stay there, Melissa? You want to just stay there? I'm holding budget. We're doing budget now. Yep. Oh. Yeah, come on up. Thanks. <laughs> Lori Blakesley. Dr. Wiegen, if you're able to join. Okay, we're moving on to, um, we don't have anything under education tonight. We're moving on to operations and A is um, the budget update. And that's will be facilitated by Don Smith. <laughs> oh, Dr. Wiegen. <laughs> I think you have a slide. Okay. We wanted to take some time tonight in the work session to bring us back to a focus on the budget. Uh, we tried this update in September and then regretfully, there was a different incident at the end of my presentation that took us off track. So we're gonna try again tonight. Uh, the purpose of this information is to ground ourselves in an understanding of why we are in the spot we are financially. And I don't think we can repeat this often enough for people to really truly understand that where we are isn't because of this board of education or previous boards or the uh, district staff, teachers, um, all employees. This is the result of, in most cases, uh, decisions out of our control. And we wanna review that today and have this be maybe more of a conversation as we go through the history of school budgeting in Wisconsin, public school budgeting in Wisconsin, and uh, talk about what that means for us as a district and why we need to make some really hard decisions coming up, okay? So um, this was back in September, some of the headlines that we saw around the state. And as I had mentioned in September, uh, Danielle from Press Gazette was on the forefront of highlighting for our community that uh, public school funding wasn't working for many of our districts. We at that point were projecting a $36 million deficit as a district. And I'd shared that with the board. And as soon as we recognized the position we were in, we began addressing it. So we'll talk a little bit more about that because we're not, thankfully, we're not at 36 million anymore. Kent, please. This goes back to 1993. Governor Thompson was in office and they enacted QEO, Qualified Economic Offer. It locked districts in to their spending at that point. And now Green Bay, as I had mentioned before, was a low spending district at the time. Low spending districts in the state of Wisconsin were punished. This is per pupil what the state would pay us for education. Lori, would you add anything to that or to keep going? I did that okay? All right. Yeah. Just to clarify, is that what the state would pay us or what we could spend per pupil? That's Lori was going to correct me there, but she didn't. She's so polite. It's it's the amount of yeah of property tax plus state aid we can collect. We can go to the next one. No, oh, this one's good. Uh, then under Governor Walker, Act 10 came in. And prior to Act 10, we were given an amount of money to cover inflation. And what Lori asked me to highlight, and Lori, jump in on this one if you want, is that year in 2011, can you see the number? Rather than giving us the inflation amount, the state actually took away. We never recovered from that. Here we are 12 years later, and we still as a district, every district in the state actually hasn't recovered from that reduction. Now, if you follow the graph all the way down, you'll see what's happened the last two years. 
we were given zero dollars to address inflation during a time when inflation has skyrocketed. We all experienced it in our own homes, in our own lives. School districts impacted in Wisconsin, were impacted in Wisconsin as well. I'll just add quickly that Ruth Conniff had a really good article that basically stated that what the governor's proposed budget would actually bring us back to 2011 spending. So by the state. So, I mean, that kind of gives, tells you the difference of kind of where we've, where we've gone. So just to restate that, if the governor got what he want in his current budget proposal, we'd only be at 2011. That's 12 years ago. Thank you. Do we know um, state spending on other areas, I'm assuming, have increased with that? So you're asking, have they increased spending in other areas? Um, I couldn't speak to that specifically. I'm assuming yes, but I'm not sure. But I would say that what the legislature would argue is that public school, or K, I should say K through 12 funding, because that includes the any money spent for private schools as well, is the largest part of the state budgets of their general fund. So that's kind of the argument where they start is that that's where the majority of the spending already is. So my understanding this year, as they look at the budget, they're going to look at the other areas. So like one of the I'm understanding from our um, when we were at the day at the Capitol was um, they right now didn't have anything on the calendar for the Joint Finance Committee to actually hear about education spending because they're going to be looking at some of the other areas first. Yeah, there's that. Here's a different way of looking at it. Uh, public school funding hasn't kept up with the cost of inflation. Josh, did you put this one together? I did. Uh, yeah, I did. This is um, just since 2018, so this doesn't go back to the huge drop in 2011. So even even since 18, we've been we've been let down a bit. Um, and yeah, we're not immune from inflation, as you saw tonight on the roofing bits. I, that stuff creeps up everywhere. In 2016, state of Wisconsin allowed low spending districts uh, to go up to 10,000. And Lori put this graph together to demonstrate that 10,000 was wonderful, but we still aren't close to the other urbans. In fact, on the right-hand side, if you look at us, uh, 10,000 in comparison to the other urbans, the next closest is Kenosha at 10,599 per pupil. We'll show you in a little while what that means for Green Bay. As the board is well aware, and many in the public are well aware, um, we are grossly under reimbursed for special education services. Each year, Green Bay Area Public School District has to transfer $33 million from Fund 10, our general fund, over into special education, Fund 27. The state reimburses special education right now at a rate hovering around 30%. In the past, it was closer to 70. And for those that can't see that graph, private schools are reimbursed at 90%. Private schools, 90% reimbursement. Now I've said this publicly and I mean it, educating students with disabilities is our obligation. I don't think we need a federal mandate to do it. We would do it anyway, but we need the funding to support it. You good, Brian? Next slide. So in the last budget session, um, the 
state government was aware of all of the ESSER funds that would be coming in uh, as COVID relief dollars to the districts. And so they had debated about what they wanted to provide for state funding. Um, there had been some conversation around not really giving an increase and then learned that by doing that, they would actually, we would actually lose the federal funds because they needed to meet their maintenance of effort. So the decision then was to provide a little over $600 million into public education funding, or I should say into K-12 funding, I'm sorry, I keep saying that, K-12 funding. Um, but because they did not raise the revenue limits, that meant that only 128 million, which had been a part of categorical aids actually went to schools and classrooms. And the larger proportion of 557 million actually went to property tax relief. So that's part of that property tax credit. So, um, so they're, they're very aware that they gave us a zero, zero per pupil increase. And I know that they've talked about um, recognizing that when this happened, that they would have to come back in this next budget session because they realized that they created a cliff for school districts. So uh, we've been operating at an expense that we can't afford. And thankfully, we have ESSER funds that will cover us through the 23-24 school year. But then in August of 24, that's when we hit that cliff and we need to balance our budget before that. So we've been tackling it, right, Judy? You wanna talk a little bit about this one? Since the start of the school year, um, under Vicki's leadership, we have met as a district team to do a retreat with our building leaders. We also held a staff retreat. Um, again, taking a look at possible reductions. So I believe the list that you see up there is pretty self-explanatory, but certainly if there are items there that you have maybe questions about um, that I could possibly clarify, please let me know. Yes. Just for clarification, stipends and rider committees that would be extracurricular activities that we provide for every student and making sure that we're making can get every student involved and feel welcome in our building in any capacity, whether it's that's not necessarily tied into just sports, but that's art clubs, I would assume that would be chess clubs that would be making sure that every student in this district feels welcome in a building. Correct. So it's not just about athletics. Thank you for pointing that out because it is also, for example, department chairs, um, house leads, um, a variety of different um, stipends and riders that are provided. And you're right, because we do measure for um, redefining ready because it's important to have our students um, belonging in our buildings and feeling that they are part of a school and part of that is would be clubs and activities. So with department chairs and um, other support that's being provided by those department chairs, that's making sure that we're having our staff ready to address socioeconomic learning and emotional learning and all those areas to making sure that our students are safe and welcome in our building. Yeah, the department chair and house lead takes on a lot of different responsibilities. Yes. So as a board member, I don't know that I've seen this list and the magnitude of the give back, right? And, and the, the savings by category, right? Because given the union representatives statements today, we want to make sure that we recognize that, you know, when they, this, looking at this as a flat list is one thing, but when you look at benefit advisory committee, that's a large chunk, right? We recognize that our primary expense is our labor. All right, but I think it would inform me as we go through this process if I could see the the savings by category so that we recognize because when presented with the handbook committee's um, you know submission, you know it wasn't uh, paired with savings and dollars, right? So I think it would it would help me if I saw this like that. Just to follow up on that a little bit, though, and I think about that, I think that's a good thing to want to see. But some of those would be those numbers for some of these categories that be just ongoing, like they're not 
fixed in time. They're not in a fixed expense because some of these things will accumulate over time. So you'd get a snapshot at best. Yeah. We could be given a snapshot and a projection, right? I don't think it's outside of possibility to show some sort of accumulation or year over year because, you know, the conversation about, you know, rolling PTO days, that's booked as a liability, right? We can, we can track that and, and see how it makes a difference over time. You're, you're testing my memory tonight, but the... Um, benefit recommendation did have the dollar amount in that memo for you. I don't have my computer in front of me to pull up that memo, but it, it yeah. Okay. okay. And Kinsey. We also went to referendum successfully through the support of our community, uh, the capital referendum to address delayed and deferred facilities projects. And then as you're all well aware, the facilities master plan, which will come to the board in May. All of this together to address our budget situation. So I'm gonna ask Josh to talk about our reality right now. Re yeah, the reality is fairly uncertain. So we've got a number up there on the screen. That's a much lower number than the 36 million you saw. Um, was that at the beginning of this year or, the, or in the summer? Um, there are a couple of reasons why that number has, has shrunk. Um, first and foremost, I, I literally just checked, um, compared to April 10th of last year, we're down about 110 employees at, overall. Um, and as CFO Robley has said over and over again, the, you know, the vast majority of our expenses in this district is, um, is salaries and benefits. Now that reduction um, was not the result of any layoffs. That's that was a result of normal staff movement, um, attrition, retirements, resignations, um, things like that. Um, the second big thing is that um, the board approved those benefit changes. So we had been we had been projecting an increase in the benefit costs. Um, particularly for health. Um, instead, we got to project a small decrease that was, so that saved, um, I think about $4 million overall in the deficit. Um, although the savings was only like $1 million over the current year, right? So the difference is instead of an increase, we're seeing a decrease. So that's $4 million swing. It, it would have been a $7 million increase if we would have done nothing. And I believe then by doing the changes we did, it was about a $4 million savings. Well, there we have it. So we had project, we had been projecting too optimistically. <laughs> um, so $20 million, I want everyone to understand that this is really a range. There are two big independent variables that are going to determine our deficit going forward. Um, the first is we do not know yet what the state budget is going to allow us um, to raise in revenue. We had been until last month using a $100 per year increase over the next two years in our projections um, in getting together with other business managers, DPI, um, other consultants. Um, they've now advised throwing $350 per year in that, in that model makes a big difference because that's cumulative. Um, so that's an extra 250 per year um, than we were originally projecting. So in that second year, that's 500 extra dollars. You could do that math 500 times 20 million, that's $10 million. So that can, that can really swing either way. Um, the second big variable here is we don't know what the salary increase will be for the next year because Boards waiting for the next budget, um, which a lot of boards are doing around um, around the state um, to make sure that we can afford the increase. Unlike past years, where we're dealing with the you know maybe a one or two percent CPIU increase, CPIU has been certified at eight point oh one percent. That would be by far, I think, the largest increase that um, I mean, certainly that that uh, the board 
has given out since I've been here, and I'm not sure the last time it went 80%. That's a that's a pretty big number. Um, so I mean, there is a world where if we get that full 303, that full 350 per year, and the board freezes all salary increases over the next two years, um, I mean, we could be looking at eight million dollars if we go the full 801, and we um, 8.01% and the state doesn't come through and we only get that extra $100 increase per year, we could be looking at $33 million. So that's how wide that 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 varies, even just a 4% increase. That's, you know, that represents eight, $9 million for, for the district. And that's cumulative, right? Um, so so I want I want you to understand that we're dealing with the range, but we have made significant progress between the the things that um, that Dr. Weekend um, highlighted on on slide ten, along with the benefit changes and just the natural reduction of staffing as we as we tighten up and right size, which is continuing in, into the next year as well. Can I just jump in here a second? That range is shocking. And I can't listen to that kind of the way the way you were talking about that range without just pointing out that this is like exhibit one of how much we are at the mercy of the whims of politicians. I mean that all of this, all of this has to do with decisions that are out of our control. Yeah, and um I'm gonna wreck that perfect segue. I'm sorry. I should I should have let I should have let you just do your next slide and then come circled back. Um, but yeah, when you think about the the earlier slide that Vicky showed, right? Um, we've not been getting these inflationary increases yet. We've been giving inflationary increases in salaries to our staff. Um, eventually, we're going to run out of the ability to do that without cutting um without cutting elsewhere i just want to clarify and i i understand your phrasing with it the inflationary increases are cost of living adjustments and it's nothing against the board it's nothing against our employees with it that's still a ramification coming down from act 10 so cost of living adjustments are not necessarily i'm saying this for anyone that's listening out there are not raises, they're cost of living adjustments on there. And the state has still tied our hands on that. So when we look at, you know, the best case scenario and we're still $8 million short, the state still has, let's let's not build them a statue if we do get that $350 increase on it, so. Thank you, and I apologize for being too cavalier with my language there, but yes, you're correct on, on that. Boy, there's so much we can't control, so much beyond uh, the scope of, of what we can do. That was a nice tee up, Josh, thank you. I wanna walk through the numbers on this slide uh, because I think it's important. So I'm gonna go back to what I originally said. The reason we are in this position isn't because of decisions that the Board of Education has made or district office has made it really comes down to decisions made in Madison. Let's start with the first one. Currently we're reimbursed at about 30% for special education. I had mentioned that before. There was a time in Wisconsin when it was 66%. So we did the math. If we were reimbursed at 66%, like we had been in the past, that would be an additional $16.6 .6 million this school year that the district would have. Just going from 30% to 66. In the past, our English learning programs were reimbursed at 70%. Today, it's 8.3. If we were reimbursed, as it had been in the past at 70%, that would be an additional $8 million this school year.
if our revenue limit per pupil was adjusted for inflation at $371.96, it would have been an additional $7.5 million this year. And lastly, I just wanted to compare us to Kenosha, who received 10,599 per student. We're about the same size. We get 10,000. If we were given that extra 599 per student, that would mean an additional $12 million this school year. We wouldn't be having the conversations we're having. Instead, we'd be talking about busing for everyone and how many more programs and staff can we add. So I don't wanna live in a fantasy world, but I think it's important that we all understand what the truth is and why we're in this spot and that we should expect better So what happens if we do nothing, Kinsey, if you could? We are in big trouble if we don't make the cuts that we need to make, if we don't uh, address the facilities in the way that we need to, we are in trouble. Now we can't rely on fund balance. Um, Josh, can you speak to that a little? Sure. No. Our district does have a healthy fund balance. Um, it's nothing extravagant. Um, the dipping into fund balance has a couple of consequences. First, it's really just a one-time fix, right? So you, you can only cover for, for so long before you're out of fund balance. Um, if you go into fund balance without planning on doing it, it's going to affect our credit rating. Um, and finally, having the fund balance that we do have saves the district money long-term because it um, it allows us to not borrow to beat payroll in the times of the year when um, the district's low on cash. So we get our payments from, from the state and local sources and federal sources at, um, at different intervals during the year. And there's certain times of the year where we just don't have a lot of money um, sitting around. So having that fund balance allows us to not take out a loan and pay interest just to make payroll. Um, so going too low on fund balance, even if we do it um, intentionally, um, we need to be very, very, very careful and understand that um, it really doesn't fix anything long term. We will be looking at Regardless of whether we address this or not, we will have to go to referendum. That's the way the Wisconsin funding for public education works. Uh, we would have to continue deferring maintenance projects. Class sizes would increase. We would be unable to continue addressing the inequities that we see across the district that the facilities master plan is actually attempting to address. We would have to reduce staff beyond attrition and reduce programming and class offerings. That's the reality. That's the reality if we do nothing. So last slide, please. Josh. Yep, so Vicki's been bringing up the facilities master planning process um, kind of throughout this presentation and that really is the key to getting out of the hole that we're in um, by by um, making, I guess, uh, smart use of our facilities ut utilization um, that allows us to lower costs. I mean, it's just just a fact of the matter that it's it's cheaper to have fewer schools. Um, in fact, the cheapest school we could run would probably be all of our kids on a single campus, and um, we bust them around on a monorail or, or whatever, right? Um, unfortunately, the the committee did not uh, did not actually propose that, um, but they are proposing some significant changes and some significant downsizing in our, our current facilities. They're also 
recommending some upsides, you know, some current facilities to make room for more kids. Um, and what you'll see as, um, as we start to investigate that plan um, further is that we're talking millions of dollars annually per building. Um, and it's just hard to get to a large number like that without, um, without building consolidation. Um, as part of that master plan though, while we can use it as a strategy to address our, our ongoing operational costs, we can also use it as an opportunity to improve all of our facilities so that all of our kids have access to state-of-the-art facilities so that um, all of our kids are going into a better situation from a facilities perspective um, than they're leaving behind. Um, it's, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm having a hard time controlling my anger when we talk about this stuff, so bear with me a little bit here. But let's just talk a little bit about um, the $5.5 billion budget surplus that our state still uh, currently has. Um, I mean, that's a shocking amount of money and the need for our public schools is deep. And it's not just Green Bay, it's every pretty much every district in this, um, this state is facing some version of what we're facing as a district. So um, I just thought I'd mention that to remind everybody that the money's there. It's just a matter of, of choice. Um, you know, what are the priorities of the, of the legislature down in, in Madison? Um, you know, I'd like to think that they, they would put children first. So, and I, I hope that this, this next budget cycle will employ that, um, that position. But, uh, again, we're at the mercy of these people that make all these decisions on, on behalf of children of the state. Can I just correct my comments? I don't want to get political, political fact. Is that what it's called in the Milwaukee Journal Fentanyl? And I also did say, don't trust my memory. So we would have had a 7.16% increase to the uh, health insurance plan, which would have been a 2.8 million increase. But based on the changes, we have an approximate $1.9 million decrease savings. Thank you, but that wasn't the plan I was referring to because I've heard those numbers. It was the handbook changes as it related to the vacation days and everything that I don't think that was paired with any dollars so I could evaluate the impact of budget. But my, my, my concern is whether it's nominal or if it's significant. Oh, okay. All right. Go ahead. Josh, before you leave, so I'm I'm trying to wrap my head around timing, right? So we are going to get the results of the task force here. We're going to see the presentation, then we're going other steps have to occur, right? Have to put together some sort of committee to address boundaries. And then I think it was the plan kind of to use the rest of the year-ish to go through the detailed project planning that um, would be required before any kind of um, plan start, there's an execution, right? We're in 24 at that point, right? So I'm trying to understand how the facility master plan, which requires the building of a new school to facilitate consolidation on the west side, augmenting schools on the east side to take advantage of that, delivers operational savings in 24-25? It's a really good question, James. Boy, we're getting a lot of feedback tonight. Um, the the timing um, would be, as you correctly point out, it's been 23-24. Um, with the planning year, that's something I think that we've committed to publicly uh, to our community. And I would recommend we we stick by our word on that. Um, 
there are frankly elements of the the proposal that the board will see in May that cannot be accomplished without a capital referendum. Um, the timing of that referendum is, is something we'll need to work out if the board chooses to pursue those aspects of, of the recommendation. There are also elements of the recommendation that do not require a capital referendum. Um, those, those elements could be executed for the 24-25 school year. Um, for example, not that I'm recommending this now, um, the, the proposed boundary changes at the high school level um, could be executed independent of a capital referendum. I get that. And I, I agree with you that there are some pieces and parts that we can move on. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to draw a relationship between those pieces and parts because you're not going to close, close the school, right? When you do that, you're going to level the, the enrollment at the four high schools, but you know, the decision to m maintain four high schools takes that off the table when it comes to real true operational savings, right? There may, there may be some, but the significant, you know, savings I, I didn't see. So I see like one or two schools where there's the intent to close one and completely relocate the population into a pre-existing school. Um, but I, I, I'm just, I struggle with the true impact or if the district has plan B, right? It's somewhere that, that we need to start discussing as we look at that gap year. I think in the long run, you're right. It's going to come in and, and it's going to make it whole, but I'm concerned with 2425 and funding operations at that point. 2425, you will, I mean, again, a lot depends on which elements of the recommendation the board decides to pursue. Um, but the plan as it stands now, even with without a capital referendum, right in 24-25, we could already be see, seeing uh, multiple million dollars in, in operational savings uh, from, from the master plan. I don't know if, I, I think you're taking this week to work with the committee on the nature of their presentation. I think that's an important question that I would like to have out of that presentation. Relating to the budget, I'm going to, if it's okay through the chairman, ask James a couple of questions regarding his legislative report that was made at our last board meeting. It's my understanding that the Joint Finance Committee did not have any listening sessions in Northeast Wisconsin. That's correct. It's also my understanding that the Wisconsin Association of School Boards had a lobby day in Madison to talk about joint, or I'm sorry, to talk about school funding in the formula. That's correct. So it's also my understanding that citizens, regardless of their age, regardless of their zip code, and regardless of their boundaries or district school buildings that they would attend, also have that access to go ahead and contact all of their state legislators and talk about the inequities that are taking place in school funding and how it's a broken system, and that there's talking points that I'm sure that have been provided by the Wisconsin Association of School Boards and other groups to feel free to reach out to those state assembly people and state senators and to encourage them to look at this since there is not a joint finance committee hearing and that's going to be the group that sets the budget for it or comes up with a proposal for that. Am I correct on that, James? Obviously, any, anyone can, you know, communicate with their uh, senator or, or assemblyman. And you're right, the, um, the Wisconsin Association of School Boards does have a platform and some talking points that we went and we lobbied on and, you know, was early in the budget process. We got a lot of less wait and sees, you know, and, and we'll, we'll follow that and track that. Uh, but any communication establishing the priority from the citizenry around school funding will support our effort. I'm currently going to Manaqua to do, um, to show up in front of one of those meetings. Um, it's not a, it's not a um, convenient location, obviously. Just clarify, you're going to Manaqua. The media market, I'm assuming in Manaqua is not significant. I'm going to assume that the population base in Manaqua in April is not going to be what it would be in Northeast Wisconsin between Sheboygan, 
north to the UP and the population base in Monaco is not going to be that same amount. It seems like a peculiar place to hold it. I think we can, yes, I would agree with all that. But if that's where they're going to be, I'm, I'm planning on going, so. Are there any other questions for Josh or Vicki regarding the last agenda item? Okay. So I, I would just like to make a point that we're, we're talking about a, a budget deficit that we have to um, manage over the next couple of years. We're, we're, what was not said tonight was that there is more competition than ever for teachers. Um, when we're talking about recruiting and making sure that we retain talented teachers. So as we go through this budget process and recognize the impact on our number one expense uh, in the district being labor, you know, we have to be very careful um, that we have competing priorities. We, we can't not be competitive, um, but we also can't overspend, right? And recognize that that's not a position that anyone wants to be in. But, you know, we have to be clear, and that's the, the nature of the question. It, there's, there's a lot riding on the facilities master plan, right? That That is the, the largest saving potential that we see in the near future and in executing that in a way where it delivers as much real value as possible is very important. Yes, Brian. And just to clarify this, obviously pay benefits and we are a people heavy industry with this. Um, there's a shortage of educators. There's a shortage of staffing throughout as our last bid for a roofing company. I'm assuming that they're short on labor as well. So all of our employee groups, obviously, we're, we've got to be competitive and make sure that we can hire the best and keep the best throughout the groups. Educators are a significant part of this, but looking at our trained staff and our employees throughout. So I just wanted to add that. Okay. All right. I think we're going to move on. But before we do that, we're going to take a 10 minute comfort break.
All right, everybody. We're going to um, get back at it here. Uh, the next thing on our agenda is um, under operations as B, recommendation for revisions to employee handbook language regarding regarding attendance and leaves. Um, and that's going to be, we've got, uh, hey, Brent. Hey, David. Invite Ben up to the table too. Yes, please. Okay, so there's been already some mentions of this topic tonight. Um, there's quite a lot going on. And so I, I'm, I think we can have a good conversation about the intricacies of this um, with all the concerned parties. So um, who, who's kicking it off? Is that you, Melissa? Go ahead, Melissa. Thank you. And I, I keep looking back because I know there's members of the handbook committee here. So if they could just stand as well, just to be recognized for all of their work, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I, along with Lori Myron, um, were asked the, over the summer by interim superintendent Ms. Byer to start a handbook committee. And I, I think we've had a little bit of a history lesson tonight. So I'm going to give you just a little bit more history, just because I like history, referring to my history teacher sitting here at the table. Um, so like Ben, I too grew up in a union household. My dad was a teamster my entire life. Um, we walked picket lines when he went on strike. He was not the president of the AFL-CIO like Ben's dad, but I too was raised in a household on the importance of collective bargaining. Um, I went to work for the teachers union for eight years and then as we heard, Act 10 happened. And unfortunately, because WEAC's membership was going to decline, there were layoffs. And WEAC didn't lay off based on who you were or what you did. They laid off based on seniority. And I was one of the lowest senior attorneys. We had 13 at the time. And so I was faced with, what am I going to do next in my life? And I was able to transition to a different school district. And then Dr. Lingenfeld took a chance and hired me here in the district in January of 2013. And I think Mr. Elbers was on my... <laughs> and, um, and I was lucky and, and fortunate enough to come into this district, but I had to make a promise. And that promise was to my dad that I would stay true to those union principles and recognize the importance of every single person in the school district because every single person who walks through our doors contrib contributes to our students' learning. And our student achievement is what has guided this committee with respect to changes to the handbook. So along came Act 10 and this district did something that most school districts didn't do. In 2012, the um, support staff collective bargaining agreements were going to expire. I think they called them memorandum of understanding at the time. And then a, the chief human resources officer, Jean Marsh, sat down and, as Mr. Tedford um, described, worked collaboratively to um, get to employee handbooks. And in 2013, the same process was done with teachers. And David will tell you that those meetings were long, there were many, but they came to a good point of getting to a handbook that the board eventually approved. I am really proud to say that when Vicki asked us to look at the handbook 10 years later, because it really hadn't been touched. It was done. Everyone breathed, I think took a big breath of relief after it was done. And we started working on other things because again, at the end of the day, we're all here for kids. And so Vicki asked us to go back to that handbook because things had started to surface that needed to be looked at. Can't really put something on the shelf for 10 years and not go back and, and look at it again. So we started that process again and there was transparency. There was collaboration. 43 people asked to be on the committee and all 43 people were invited to be on that committee. And we started those meetings. And again, sometimes the way you envision how things are gonna play out does not always work. And so we tried to write language and rewrite language with 43 people at the table. And honestly, it was painful. So we spared all of those 43 people um, numerous meetings. And you'll see in your memo 
we have had 25 meetings with various different groups over the language that we're bringing forward tonight. Luckily, we got to spend a lot of time with these three gentlemen and Karen uh, in the back of the room in small group meetings trying to hammer out that language. And it wasn't just about vacation and unpaid leave that you're going to hear about tonight. Those are probably the two, the two points that we most were not able to come to 100% agreement on. And that's okay, because that's the whole point of the process. It was respectful. There were conversations where we agreed to disagree, but we collaborated and we did listen. And there were some things such as when we talked about the vacation rollover, initially we had proposed only rolling over five days. We heard the concerns from Ben, especially our employees who we are hiring mirrors and windows for our kids and our employees that have relatives in other countries. They want to save their vacation to be able to go back to their home countries to visit family and celebrate those really important things with their families and five day rollover wasn't enough. So we went back and said, they're right. They need more than five days. And so we came back with 10 days. So there have been changes along the way. We have not been able to come to agreement on every fine point, but the list that we're going to go through tonight is very long of the language we looked at. And the reason we arrived at leave language is because in those initial meetings, and we did posters and the post-it notes and everyone's been through those exercises who's at this table. The number one thing that staff brought to the table was leave language in some form, bereavement leave, vacation leave, unpaid leave, um, paid days off. Some version of paid leave kept surfacing as needing to be addressed. And when we talk about student achievement, our staff in the classrooms and building is the number one thing that affects student achievement. So from our lens and our priority of student achievement, that's what we knew we had to address as well. So I don't wanna frame this as the purpose of this meeting, as you heard earlier in the comments was to cut, that was not the purpose of these meetings. This was process improvement. What have we learned over 10 years to make that handbook better, to recruit and to attract the best staff for the best kids in the Green Bay area? And that is what guided the discussion. And sometimes when you have those discussions, when everyone's there for the purpose of kids, you're not going to agree and that's okay. So that's how we got to tonight. So there's my history lesson. Um, the, we wanted these gentlemen at the table so that you have a full picture of all of that discussion. Lori is going to walk us through um, the highlights. I think you have a, the full language, you have a clean document, you have a compare document, you have a new document, you have uh, our memo that has all those 25 meetings detailed, you have the process, you have the links to the notes. So you have everything and the public has it all too because it's all uploaded in board docs. So when we talk transparency, we're really proud of our transparency and we're really proud of this process. So I'm gonna, if, if they wanna add anything before Lori gets into her review, I'll let them talk. Go ahead, David, you know you want to. <laughs> Hopefully I pressed the right button. Uh, so we have over the last, uh, what is now, you can do the math quickly, 10, 11 years worked really hard to make sure that we work collaboratively with the district. And we've had very open conversations. We've had difficult conversations and we, uh, we agree with uh, the process and the feelings the district has about the process. Uh, and this, and to add a piece though, too, this has been about budget as well. And we, come to the table with that in mind that cannot be ignored. And we understand the circumstances that we are in, but that was a consideration of this as well. And we need to point that out as well. So uh, I'm sorry I didn't print out a copy of this because we had a different meeting we were running over the last couple of hours. So overall, um, Again, we appreciate this board's commitment to the process. We, can, we appreciate Lori and Melissa's commitment to this process. I tell our members and Brent does as well all the time that this work uh, is not easy and we do our advocacy and our arguing as much as possible behind the scenes because at the end of the day, we are about improving this district and moving this district forward. And that's always been our intent, so. 
That's all I have to say about that. Well, thank you. Thanks, you guys. A um, couple other things just to add to that. Um, for those who don't know, my background is actually process improvement and lean. And so when I got here a year and a half ago, uh, I, you know, the first thing I do is look at the handbook and all other processes, but as people would ask questions, I would make notes in the handbook. And if you saw, uh, you're welcome to flip through this, but there are notes throughout the entire handbook because there's so many questions that come to HR. So to me, that's like, okay, that's a, um, an area for improvement to clarify. And you'll see a lot of the things in here are either grammatical or typos or clarifying words just that need to make sure that people understand. So not all of it is actually change. Some of it is a lot of just, like I said, typos and uh, clerical things. So again, like Melissa said, our, the purpose of this obviously um, is student achievement. Like that is whether it's the budget, if it's the handbook, if it's the BAC, it's whatever it is we're working on, stipends and writers, student achievement um, is always the number one thing in our forefront. Um, so you're, you, like Melissa said too, you already have the whole thing. I'll just go through a few of them and then kind of highlight some of the things. If you have questions, certainly let me know. Um, one of the things uh, just was just a definition of domestic partner that is no longer valid since 2018. So that would be omitted. So um, that hasn't been in existence in the state of Wisconsin for a long time. So that would just update that language that pertains to that. The um, next one is really the leaves. So um, non-paid, leaves of absence, what we're gonna, in our frontline system, we're gonna add a couple different categories or would recommend to add a couple categories. One would be non-paid for medical, non-paid medical self would be one, non-paid medical family, and then non-paid medical personal. And then the other thing, actually the fourth one is really, we would like to have a, um, a separate section in frontline for IPP, which is our um, self-funded uh, income protection, short-term disability plan so that we can have better tracking on all of those areas. So for data collection, we do have data on the amount of leave that people take. Um, and I believe that's been shared out as well. So um, that would be one part is just to have these uh, different buckets kind of broken out. So the um, non-paid personal is probably the one of, of biggest uh, discussion. We looked at, um, like Melissa said too, we know that student achievement um, has there's a direct correlation with, um, and I actually can read just, just a quote. It says the relationship between the student attendance and their student achievement is a direct correlation to teacher attendance effectiveness in the strongest school related de um, determination of student success. So we know there's a correlation with that. We have, we looked at the former um, CBA language, which said at the time, should have brought little cheaters. Uh, Non-paid leave for longer than two continuous work days would be approved only once in a five-year period for any individual employee and may not be used to extend summer recess, but no less than three consecutive non-paid days may be requested in order to receive this leave. So we use this as our base. And then what the recommendation would be is that three non-paid personal days, again, this is not medical for self or family, this is personal for um, the employee, that it would be um, three days um, every five years. We also have in here um, that it would not be to be able to be added on to a calendar break. So, um, and also not the first 10 days of the school year nor the last 10 days. There was here, it just said the, um, to extend summer recess, which would obviously be the last 10 days or the first 10, just like that too. Um, we know that, um, Currently, the when you asked about the cost, so the cost that we have so far, um, and we still have two months to go, will be ju is just shy under two million dollars for sub costs right now. Now, granted, just so that's not misconstrued, that's not for just unpaid personal leave, right? That would be for all types of leave, but we do know that we have a um, sizable amount of unpaid personal leave currently. The other thing that that does is um, the unpaid leave, it, it adds to staff burnout for those who um, are staying. I, we looked at some um, nationwide data and it was interesting. It said um, the average teacher is out 9.4 days and in Green Bay, 
ours is 10.7, again, as of to date, not including the next two months. The national average for um, staff, which is considered to be an excellent attendance, which is zero to three days nationwide is 18%. Green Bay is 23.2%. So we have a much higher, which is awesome, rate of teachers, this is just teachers, that have less than three days absent. So if the national is 18% and we're at 23%, I mean, that's really good. So on the, on the flip side, chronic over 17 days, um, we aren't looking quite as strong. But my point on that um, is that the people, the 23% who are working hard all the time, they are burning out from covering some for the others. The other thing that unpaid time does is it benefits those who are um, fiscally able um, to be off and not everybody might be in that same position. Um, any questions on that? Yeah. I feel that we should be proud of the 23%, okay? The other percent, that needs to be addressed somehow without hurting everybody else. You know, this all of a sudden now you're the 23% and then next year or two years from now, you have two things in your life that you need to go to. You know, how, how can we tell somebody they can't do something so special? So to clarify a little bit on that. So everybody always gets two personal days per year. They can also carry over those two personal days. So they would have four. And if they have three, so they can actually take seven days. So if they wanted to take it on an event, and that's every five years, um, sometimes we have to say no to some things, right, also. And that's life also, right? So to um, because our, our purpose is student achievement, and we know that teachers important to be in the class. Yes, and I also think that curriculum is very important for achievement, and we haven't been able to address that yet either. I'm really... I'm really concerned about this because we want to have the best teachers. We want to have the best custodians, secretaries, all these people. We have to make it a priority. And I don't think that, you know, cutting and slashing away at these, these things is going to help very much at all. Okay, we don't feel like we're cutting or slashing. So maybe I guess I interpret that differently because we're, we're doing pretty much exactly what was in the collective bargaining agreement before which was the three days every five years. And I don't know how long, David would have to speak to that, how long that was in existence. Um, the reason, at least my the history that I heard is that the reason they stopped doing it is because it was really difficult to track. And we are looking at a different HRIS system, which will be a different conversation someday. I think there's two comments on this. One of them, and I'm gonna ask Mr. Harswick to kind of respond with that as well, having the institutional knowledge there. Um, recognizing that in past when we've looked at changes like this, we've worked with groups to make sure that those um, that outreach is taking place. I'm talking about our change in benefits as far as prescriptions um, with health insurance benefits. Just it's been the tradition of this district to make sure that that education part is taking place. I, I would like to know, and Mr. Harswick, I'll let you respond to the other part too, if you would like, has there been outreach made to staff to see that they're aware of those numbers, um, both on within our teaching staff and then our, our facilities and support staff on there. They want, they want that, yep. Have we looked at making sure that we can shave those numbers down before we have to go through with a handbook language change? That's what I'm asking. So the, so here's the issue. There is no, there's no limit right now in the handbook. There's no criteria right now in the handbook. And so our conversations are dominated with how do you be equitable, transparent, and um, not subjective and be objective in your approval and your non-approval of these days. And given that there is no handbook language, I don't think anyone sitting at this table, well, I don't want to speak for everybody, but, but definitely Lori and I don't want to be making those judgment calls as far as what you approve and what you don't approve. And so everything for the most part has been approved. 
I, and I just want to clarify one thing. This really doesn't affect as much our um, trades and our, our um, hourly staff because most of our hourly staff that are not school year employees are able to get, they have vacation and sick leave and that sort of thing. There is an impact on it, especially when we're looking at the unpaid leave. And I recognize that the number that you use for the sub system, it's tough to measure with that. But an unpaid leave, the, the staff is giving that, that pay back to it. So the finance, unless I'm completely misunderstanding something and, you know, I can understand if we're looking at, you know, they're, they're not taking part of their insurance or whatever with that, that's not costing the district compared to the leave that we have budgeted. And yeah, I'm not sure we can put a cost that would be reflective of the uh, student impact when we have staff that is out as much as they are. So if you wanted data, we have over um, like 342. So over 12% of our staff have taken non-paid personal leave in the last four years. Two times. Oh, I'm sorry, I did not mean to. Sorry, have taken it two times in the last four years. So it's repetitive. So that is a concern. And, and I understand the, the points being brought up with student achievement on there, but the numbers we're looking at, and if we, we used one part of it, we were talking about the financial part of it, that's a concrete number. And and I'm, I'm a teacher, I understand when there's absences with that, but an unpaid leave is not costing the district a significant amount on that. The student achievement part, I understand, that's why I brought up the question of making sure that we redirect and, and work on this as an opportunity to build on it, but the financial impact of there, if it's an unpaid leave, is minimal, if I'm correct. Again, I think um, there's the financial part would be a, a component, but I, again, I can't put a financial, not only on the student part, but also on the staff burnout recovering for others. Um, we had somebody from the handbook committee who is an assistant principal and spoke to the fact of the concerns she has in her building for just that reason and said she can't put a, a dollar value on that. So I can't put a dollar value on that part of it. I can tell you, I can give you data on how many people take it and how often. I can tell you how many people um, take it consistently and other, other things. Right now, the rule of thumb that we are doing based on Mr. Murley's and then Vicki validated um, this year, the, the guideline is that they have to ask HR, and which is me, and then they get up to three days and we were doing that uh, for unpaid time. We're tracking it, um, all those people. Are there people who want more than four days? Yes, excuse me, more than three days in, in addition to their personal time? Yes, um, and those actually, we've worked with David on a lot of those, um, but that's what we're trying to come is some consistent parameters so that we can be fair to all, not just those who can financially afford to do so. And also not impact student achievement as well. Go ahead. I'm trying to navigate, you know, kind of what I heard during the public forum and as you described the, the process. Um, to the union representatives, this particular piece, right, a lot of changes, right, and it feels like there's a couple sticking points where there's disagreement, right, so um, I understand that making changes to a, a publication with 43 people is excruciating, and I understand why it was pulled back, why you made changes, so um, I'm trying to figure out um, the the nature of the disagreement, right? Is it, um, it is some of the components that the presentation of the final work, right? That was to be presented. Do we feel like committee and union all agree on the fact that it was well vetted, everyone got an opportunity at the end, right? To, to challenge or were there, 24 meetings where everything was done and then a, a presentation was made and here was the changes that was accumulated and there may be what I feel is that there's still concern that there's work left to do uh, and I'm I, I challenge I want to make sure I hear from both sides of the table no no one is suggesting 
uh, Mr. Lyerly, that anything was done last minute or anything like that. We're not saying that at all. Uh, our executive board in executive session had a number of opportunities to review language. We knew about the district's uh, proposal about unpaid leave. So there has been no issue with anything behind the scenes, you know, last minute, et cetera. I want to be clear about that. Uh, we have a, and, and I would need to be clear about this too. This is not collective bargaining. And to the district's credit, you have operated with us in good faith for over the last decade, whether it has been meet and confer meetings, whether we're talking about sitting down and actually what we can bargain over, a CPI increase, all of that to the district's credit and frankly ours too has been done in good faith and done um, as equals, I would say, in that sense. We knew the district's position on this and I will say that we recognize that there needs to be a guardrail. We too have been asking for clarification about this for over a year and to get to Mr. Mills's question too. Uh, and to Superintendent Byers' credit, she made this piece happen because frankly, we were asking for meetings like we've been having under the previous superintendent and they did not take place. It was not frankly until Vicki moved in this position that it did. So while we have gone through this and I understand the district's position, we, we do not fundamentally agree with the remedy to the unpaid leave uh, proposal. We think the years are too many and the ability to not attach it to a break is in, a, in the calendar is what we uh, are opposed to. Does that help? All right. Okay, Brian. No, I'm not. <laughs> All right, so I'll move on unless you guys have other questions, you can come back to it if you'd like, of course. Okay. Um, the next thing was just talking about health insurance in the handbook currently it talks about, um, there's some contradictory language it, in the paragraph it talks about you have to work 20 hours and you're eligible for insurance, but in the grid that shows below, it has um, different fragments of numbers based on um, hours worked and what those rates are accordingly. And so to clean up um, the grid, um, it, we were just gonna do straight line, 30 to 40, 20 to 30, well, 29.99, 20, 10 to 19.99 and 5.88 to 9.99. So that way it just cleans it up and it's a lot simpler. Um, as a result of this, actually 15 people will benefit and pay um, a lot less for their insurance because they will move from that third bucket to the second bucket. So that's actually a better benefit. Any questions on that? All right, um, attendance, just in general, um, our current wording is really just very brief. And so we um, do have some clarifying things of attendance and expectations that we've added. Um, district fund property. Um, this was a policy that was brought a couple of weeks ago, um, policy number 742. So this would be added to the handbook. This is about uh, district equipment and use. Um, emergency school closings, another one. So he, here, the, the language that was currently in the handbook, um, we didn't think was um, applicable. I shouldn't say applicable. respectful, I guess, to all, because it was confusing. It had um, some of our non-exempt staff were required to be there um, without exempt staff being there. And so we're cleaning all of that up. Um, and so that that would not be the case. Um, we are recommending that we eliminate the um, early release and the late start completely. So non-exempt staff by FLSA get paid for hours worked. Um, in all the other districts that we looked at, there are not any other, we've got seven others. Um, nobody pays non-exempt staff for hours they don't work for snow or early release days. They, um, but we, we have added that they could um, take unpaid time, they could use a benefit, so a lot of the staff get um, vacation time, um, or they could make it up during that payroll week if they would like. So we would give them a couple different options, but it would be consistent with FLSA law by not paying staff for time they aren't worked. Um, if you wanted a dollar value on that, it's about $75,000 for every two hours that that occurs, uh, which is the equivalent of one FTE in our district. Okay. 
So again, we, all the other um, districts that we looked at, none of them are paying for early release or late start for non-exempt staff. Uh, let's see what else. Holiday. Um, we just are removing the religious connotation with the holidays. So instead of saying Easter, we're having a floating holiday. Christmas Eve and Christmas Day will become December 24th and 25th to separate church and state. Vacation. That's the other big one. So vacation, um, again, we looked at a lot of other districts. I think we have um, 10 plus districts that we looked at in the area. So we, again, we want to be um, competitive, recruitment and retention, and we wanted to make sure that we could um, be consistent and similar to other districts. What happens is what, the, what we're recommending is that people actually earn time sooner and that it gets capped at 25 days. So um, what, it, what ends up happening, the net would be an additional 15 days that that individual would get over years. So people are not losing um, days at all. In fact, people would, there are, I have this numbers here, 32% would have an immediate um, better benefit. Um, of course, we, uh, what we did is we took five years back from anybody who would be at the cap, so up to the 20 years versus now it's at um, 24. We would grandfather in. Um, there's 61 people that would be grandfathered in. The, um, you know, we, there's no guarantees of who's going to be here when, right? So we don't know if somebody who's here at, at year five will be here at year 30 or 25 for that matter. When we looked at the actual um, proposed days, I mean, the current year and proposed days, it actually ends up being more cumulative days over time for every employee. So the, um, like I said before, the additional is 15 days um, that somebody would get from beginning to end for that. Just to give you some comparison, um, Madison has, they have a maximum of 26 days and five days carryover. So I'll also talk about the carryover in a second, but I'll just give you the data so you have it as well. De Pere has 25 days, no carryover. Um, Appleton, 25 days, five days carryover. Ashwaubenon, 23 days, no carryover. Howard Swamico, 10 days per year, five days carryover. Hewaskam, 10 days per year. Kenosha, 20 days max, five day carryover. Manitowoc, 23 days, no carryover. Nina had uh, 30 days, but I don't have their carryover. I think it's zero, but I don't, I'd have to verify that. Racine has a max of 25 days and 10 days carryover, but the carryover days have to be used by 1231. We also looked at the city of Green Bay, which has a maximum of 25 days. So we didn't do this arbitrarily. This was with data and looking at what other districts do. And like Melissa pointed out before, we started with a five day carryover because most of these are zero or five. And we went to 10 based on feedback that we received. The other thing is that, um, for the 10 day carryover, what that would be is if this um, would get approved, we would let staff know now. So they would have the entire next school year to use that time. And it would be June of 2024. So really the July 15th, 2024 paycheck that would pay out up to the 25 days for anybody who had excess. So we would wanna make sure that, that they have that time. The other thing, um, this is actually to encourage a work-life balance, um, and also it decreases our overall overall liability um, for sure. Um, let's see what else? Um, sure. When we're hearing comments during the public forum, obviously we aren't able to ask questions, and we're at a spot where we have a person who had made comments out there that, as a board, we're able to ask questions. So I just wanted to point that out to any other board members. So. Andrew. Um, who, who's the chair? Who's the chair? Who's the chair of this person in the meeting? Don? Don, but. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, I think that isn't the city of Green Bay 30 days? Isn't the city of Green Bay have uh, have 30 day rollover? I don't have their rollover amount. I just have what they earn on that one. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time debating on it. I, I don't see 
I don't see what's I don't see what's gained here. Um, I don't see anything here that's going to seriously actually at, at all help us out with the financial situation we're in here. We we don't hire a sub when uh um, we don't hire a sub when custodians are on leave. They cover for each other and other other positions like this. Um, I I think that. I think that we're we're splitting hairs here, and you know if if we are, I mean, look at the budget presentation. We're we're not anytime soon going to be able to maybe be the best in in the pay, and so so I'm moving from addressing vacation, which is uh, primarily for our hourly folks. Now talking about the the teachers. Um, but for both, roll, you know, both rolling over here is something that we're we're doing, and we can't afford to maybe have as big of increases someday in the future. But we have something different than those other school districts have. We have this carryover that you can build towards for something special. Teachers, we don't have a big rollover you can build to towards something. But um, maybe we have something that's a little bit more a little bit more special as far as. Um, as far as personal days, and I think people look at little advantages when they're looking at looking at where to go. So that's that's where I'm at on this. I, I just want to. We heard um, from Representative Shelton tonight about um, att attraction and recruitment and equity, and I, I just want to bring your attention to the the middle part of this graph for vacation accrual. So again, this, this isn't about cuts. This is not, again, about always about where the budget savings was, because if you look at our memo, there were a number of priorities within the handbook committee, including um, thriving workforce and including attracting and retaining the best. And if you look at the middle of that schedule, that's, that's where the problem is. When employees are here for, um, five to the 15 years and they're not accruing vacation fast those also are our employees who have families and who want to take those summers off and and we heard from matt that i'm just like matt i don't get my summers off either and so i'm using my vacation to take my summer vacation and to take off spring break when we work over spring break. And, and that's why it's so critical for all of our employees, not just those at the end of their careers, but those in the middle of their careers to be able to have that work-life balance and to be able to get those breaks during those times of the year. And if you're looking at an employee with seven years of experience in 12 days, that's not three full weeks, that's two weeks and two days. If you're looking at an employee of 15 years who has 20 days, that's four weeks. Now it's going to be five weeks to take off those really critical days and those critical moments in your career to be able to have that vacation. And then over the course of your career, you're going to have 25 days versus those 20 or 22 days. You're going to have 25 days much longer to be able to have more days. And so at the end of your career, you've had 15 more days. That's not a cut. And we are also grandfathering in those employees who are on the precipice of getting those 30 days and who already have those 30 days. So I think you have to look at really, are we looking for the, the greater good of the organization? Are we looking for the attracting and retaining? Are we looking for what we can do within the budget constraints? Recognizing you're right, we do not fill behind, but there is a cost to lost um, work time. There is a cost to things not getting done because we're shuffling and Ben will tell you how we're shuffling with the utility guys having to go into schools and clean schools because we don't have enough people who are working on the utility crew in order to do those things. So there, there is both sides of, of the issue and in both um, ways of looking at, at this issue. Would you look at this as similar to compressed pay schedules that have taken place before? I I want us to figure out a way that we can come. I understand the compression part of it in, in the earlier days. I think we need to figure out 
and, and we can obviously do this as a board that's hail end to continue to work with it and figure it out. So um, to my fellow board members, many years ago, you can press the pay cycles or the pay scale so you can reach the top quicker and go with it. And, and I can see the intent on this, but I hope that we can figure something out with this as a board, so. The other, oh, go ahead. So I recognize that some of the policy changes address achievement by keeping people in the classroom. This doesn't feel like that. This feels like a benefit and, and maybe trying to uh, uh, attend to a building liability over time and both in accumulating more days and taking more days. And I would really like to see kind of the utilization, right? Because I don't know if I'm talking about people that retire and we are now paying out a large sum of money because they've accumulated a, a significant number of um, days and now they have a benefit. Or if this is attributing to the number of staff that are available to do their jobs based on this. I, in the numbers that I do see, I think we're talking about a, the end of life cycle payout, right? And, and the liability that we're taking into the future on this. And so this, in, in my mind, this is completely budget. Uh, oh, and, and understanding the liability and, and managing that versus the unpaid leave and I had I was trying to be thoughtful. I had something a, a question, but I needed to uh, regroup a little bit. There are things about public education that are specific to public education. People being available to do their job at a particular period of time is universal, right? If you are a project-based organization or if you have to give burgers to a customer, is always a problem. I don't see an analog where the private industry addresses that concern by saying, you can't do this and you can't use your time there. They leave it to line managers. They leave it to organization where they say, we have these days to be coveraged, kind of work it out, right? And I, I know that that may not be enough, but I have a real guttural reaction to uh, the, or, the organization attending to what really is a performance problem by policy that is not seen elsewhere. I, I can't imagine, I can't look at a, a, a environment that I've been in professionally where I've been told, you know, you can't, and I know that some say you can't take between Christmas and, and New Year's if that's the big part, but even, in my industry, which has a peak season, um, we say the number of people that can be off is constrained, but we don't say you can't be off on Friday, you can't be off on Monday. It's, I, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling. I, I'll tell you, if, if there's some words of wisdom that can inform me that my position is incorrect and, and, and I'm apply, looking at this through the wrong lens, please do. But right now, I feel like it's a reaction to a performance problem um, through a constraint, and I don't know how to analyze, uh, interpret that. So maybe I can help with some of that. So um, that's why most districts do not give any unpaid time. You will not find in a handbook unpaid time as a category because districts know that they don't want to just grant that. Um, my experience in private sector is um, both, right? Sometimes it's just, you just need to have people and they shuffle it, do whatever. Um, but I also have had experience in private sector where we didn't allow any unpaid time because of the concern of the discrimination, that it would favor those financially able and not those who couldn't. So um, I had that in, in private sector also. I, I think so professional teaching staff have medical time off and then two days paid and then we're so you're saying across all the other districts that don't provide unpaid it's still just medical and then two days there's one local district that has converted to pto which it's 
something that we would talk about someday because it's a whole different conversion, but that's a whole different mindset. It's really looking at PTO for all your time um, that you would have off. Bereavement, emergency, religious, all the different things. Right. Whereas we have an array of all of those things in separate buckets. So um, it's, a, it's a different concept. It's more like private sector to say, you have so many PTO days, you can use them however you want to use them, right? And you run out, you run out. You can carry over over many and that's it. But then it's an allotment. So there's, um, I only know of one district that's doing that right now, but they have had success with it. But it's a bigger conversion. Um, it would be a bigger conversion for us to do that. But I, I think on the vacation, there's two different um, decisions, I guess. One is the accrual rate, um, you know, the whole schedule. And the other part is the 10 day, because the 10 day applies to everybody, not just non exempt in this group. That would also apply to admin and everybody else that anybody who gets vacation time, that it that is across the district um, for um, everybody that gets, anybody that earns vacation time, that 10 day carryover would be applied to everybody. And part of the reason on the liability side is that if you earn it at year, I'll just say 2000 for easy numbers, you earn it at rate um, in the year 2000 and in the year 2023, you have had that amount and that's a different rate, right? That you're cashing that out. So that's the liability. I know Angie's not here. To, I don't think she's on. That could speak to it. But as far as like getting those kind of numbers, I'm not. We'd have to try to figure out what we could do to, to validate that, for you. Yeah, I don't think I need to. I, I just was looking at it, and I I understand it. You have an escalator because your cha pay changes. Yeah, I, I get that. I was just trying to apply it to the. Uh, achievement, and I just didn't see a relationship with the achievement. So those are all the topics that I was just going to review. Um, if there's others that you have in front of you that you had questions on, I'm happy to try to answer those for you. Brian? And, and just relating to this, again, this is an opportunity. We have five or six people up here with it, and I'm just curious if anyone has anything they'd like to add to those, to the comments being made or statements that they'd like with it. Okay. So yeah, any other data? I wrote a couple of things down, but if there's any other data or information you'd like, just please let me know. I'm um, happy to try to get that for you. If any other questions, of course, let us know. Go ahead. I'm really curious about the discrimination you mentioned about if some people were financially able to take time off or not. I don't understand how that's the employer's, uh, how, what if they can't afford it? But I mean, who's, why is the employer involved in their um, financial? Yeah, what, what it came to um, in private sector, not here, it came, the question we had um, brought to us was um, a couple of different things. One is, A, if I have a partner or spouse that wins a trip every year, so then does it favor those who are married? Number two, those who can financially afford it, can that do it? Because people also complain sometimes about sick time for family, that means it favors those who have children. So what about those who don't have children? Should they get more sick time? So there was all of the conversation that came forth at the same time. Again, this was private sector. And so that organization said, we're just not gonna do unpaid time. I feel like that's a cop out to not do that for that reason. I think we could also, I think we can find some problem solving. I agree with the things you said, James, that was the first question I had is why wouldn't it be up to the super, um, the principal or somebody in that area, if there's somebody that's abusing this, why would we create a policy to punish or, you know, so that other people couldn't have that opportunity if it arose? And I know there was a response during when I, I asked that ahead of time, just reviewing the information, but that's a concern to me is that this is a blanket. I always say, you know, one kid in class was chewing gum, so the whole class has to stay in for recess, right? I'm just not a person that supports typically a policy to enforce to address the performance or the issues of a few. So that's my concern. There was discussion on um, just the request for unpaid time. And um, a comment made was that it's easier to go to, a, it's easier to take unpaid time than it is to go to a conference. 
because if you go to a conference, you have to fill out a form, explain why you want to go, do all of those things, and talk to your supervisor, your one-up, as to what you want to achieve in that. And to take unpaid time that impacts the students also um, would is a lot easier. And so that would be the recommendation is that they would talk to their one-up. They would have that conversation. They would say, hey, I'd like to go to my parents' 50th wedding anniversary, you know, whatever it might be, and have people start planning that a little bit farther, not just a trip every single year because they want to take off a week in March in addition to spring break. So I don't know if, you know, on the table, obviously we can work with you to potentially put forward changes, but that sounds reasonable, right? You know, if a question is, people are just, you know, marking unpaid leave as a reason for being absent versus planning the leave, right? And having a process where you have to kind of be approved and make sure that it is okay with building administration. Just make sure everyone's clear. I think that there should be guardrails, but they should be guardrails that are sensitive to the needs of each individual building versus at the policy level, where you're just uniformly applying some restrictions that make sense for some, don't make sense for others. So if as part of the handbook update policy, we can come up with, here's how you get access to the unpaid leave. I think that's a conversation that should be had. And that was that is part of the process that we have in the actual detail of it, that they do have to do that. The concern was um, variation from building to building. And so that's why we wanted the guardrails to say, so that we could have something consistent too. Can you give us the numbers as far as how many of these, if it's possible to find out, how many of these unpaid leaves were approved with a significant amount of time beforehand? And I'm going to be purposely vague with significant on it. If we know how, when it was approved as opposed to the date, if it's something that can be pulled up easily, as opposed to, I'm not going to be here for the next five days. Good luck finding yourself for me tomorrow. Um, it, that is not typically the problem. Um, is the short notice on that. We have people now asking for next year already. You know, they're planning, they're saying, hey, I want to go in September. I want to take an extra week off. Can I just take um, that those, those extra days? Or if people know they're going to get married, I want to take, I want to get married and I want to take a honeymoon. So I want to be gone for 10 days. And we're saying you can only be gone for, you know, the five, you can't be gone for 10. So plan your honeymoon in the summer or, what, or spring break or winter break or those kinds of things. So um, it's not so much the late ones, because the late ones are typically medical related. And so that's why we're separating those into a separate bucket. This is truly personal. I want to, I want to be off for whatever reason. So we typically get, I would say, reasonable notice of those. Just for clarification, would you say the majority of them are scheduled an adequate amount of time before? So building principals would know that and subsystems, and we would be able to have an understanding that those teachers will be gone enough that it can be planned ahead for. I would say the vast majority of time we do know in advance. Now subs, it's always challenging to get subs. And depending on the time of the year, that's why the concern was attaching it to the breaks. We know we've got data that shows, you know, the day before and the day after a spring break, you know, we'll have 400 plus people out. That, that's tough, right? You're not going to get that many subs. Same with this winter break, same with um, spring break, winter break and Thanksgiving are the biggest hitters that we have a ton. We limit those days already to the 5% of the personal time. So that 5% in the employee group is how it currently stays. That's one of the things on here is that it would actually be in the building. We would um, specify that to the building of the 5% for employee group. Because I think that we, we think that was the intent. Um, so that would be, and that would still apply that they're attached to a break period, but, um, we only have a few of those in the year. That's really, like I said, the Thanksgiving, the winter and the spring break. Those are the three toughest. Okay. Anyone else? Laura. Thank you for answering all these questions. The other, my impression, I don't remember if it was something I read or discussed, but it seems that there's certain percentage that consistently take advantage of the 
unpaid days, which is where the fairness thing comes in, which I understand. And, but, um, but that was because even I think with your question, Brian, that's what made me think of that. Because even if they're planning way in advance, it's the same people always taking advantage of this. The remaining teachers are the ones carrying the burden of those employees. So that was part of the issue, which was why I said, well, can the principal determine if they've already had, you know, um, that amount of time off? But that I think is an important consideration. Yeah, we have, um, as far as unique users, almost 40% of staff in the past four years have taken unpaid time. Any? Okay, it's just, wow, that's, um, this became a problem when? Has this been a historic problem? Has this, and, or has it been exacerbated by the impacts of COVID and there's a increased number of personal days being taken? I, I'm trying to determine, you know, as we evaluate these changes, do we ride out the storm? Or does it correct back or has this been a perpetual problem and it's actually just growing? You know, I can only speak to the data that we have, um, which is also challenging to get because we don't have those different buckets within frontline and had to have our, our team try to really siphon through all of that. We know there was a peak, obviously COVID, those two years in COVID, people weren't traveling, right? Um, even bereavement leave was limited, right? Because people weren't going anywhere um, and having postponed funerals. Um, we know that obviously there was a huge peak after COVID because it was, I can go again, right? Flights are open. So is there some of that potentially? Um, I, I don't know what that looks like going forward. I can't speak to what it was pre-COVID. I don't know if David or anybody else has other data or they know like what that history was. I don't have that. This being tied into it and you know, looking at the data from COVID and, and the availability of subs. I know that there's been outreach for subs and trainings. Have we seen a decrease in, it's tough to compare to COVID, but have we seen a decrease in the number of internal sub coverage that's taken place with the district over the last, uh, we'll say three years and specifically the last, yeah, are we seeing an, a downward trend as far as internal coverage for staff members and are we seeing an increase in available subs? I think that's two different things if I'm hearing your question correct. So internal subs, we have a different process for people who can sub and obviously in the elementary level that doesn't happen as much at secondary, right? Depending on how many preps you have and if you're available to cover internally. So that would be the internal part. I, I don't have data with me that says, I know um, Angie said, oh, I think it's up to, do you know where Vicki yeah. Oh, yeah. We've seen an increase in internal subbing this year, significant. And I think that goes back to the concern about burnout for our, our teachers that are, aren't taking advantage of the opportunities to be absent. And I think your second part was just getting subs in general, right? Do we have that? Um, I'm probably biased um, because it's um, my team, but I think we do a great job in getting sub coverage. A lot of it though, I have to say also is people at DOB who are helping cover certain areas. But when you have between three and 400 people out in a day, it's hard to cover all of those all the time. So I need to speak to this as well because I need to represent uh, all of our members' voices. So there has been increased pressure um, in with internal subbing. We've heard from members this year, last year, uh, that the, the pressure for them to take their prep time to fill in if their job is, you know, down here at, they may be housed here at DOB, but they're out in other schools. They may be an interventionist, could be a coach, et cetera. So we have heard from them and their voices need to be heard as a part of this conversation. So I wanna say again, what I said before, that we do recognize the piece around needing some guardrails. We have asked for criteria because we were getting a number of questions from members about how does this get approved? And so that's why we've had this conversation. So, and we're, we are very open to having a continued conversation about this in the coming weeks.
back in the day when I was a teacher, there were guardrails. It was all set. Then did they take that all away? By we, you would have to include me as a part of that conversation <laughs> in 2013, 14. So we had extensive conversations around leave, around personal leave and unpaid leave. And frankly, uh, both sides agreed to remove what had been in the contract at that time. When was that? That was 2013. I mean, we spent six months working on the handbook at that time. So it was a full on every Tuesday night for two to three hours between January and May of 2013. And so we covered a lot of ground and, you know, there were, it, Melissa is right too. There, I, I know the number of times that Lori has mentioned that, for example, that department share stipends probably shouldn't be in the handbook. And I wouldn't disagree with that. We reached a point where we didn't know what to do with it. So it was a holding place. We didn't want to lose that document until we put it there. So in retrospect, I think that I wish we had made a different decision, but that's what the decision we made collectively at the time back in 2013. So was there no handbook at all before then? No, there was, but there was also a memo of understanding, but, the, but you, had different, you had different unions coming off of their contracts at different time. And I don't want to speak for, you know, ask me and, and your timeline of that, Ben, but uh, the reason that I remember that we did a full on press, if you will, a review of the handbook was that GBEA uh, was coming off of their contract and the MOU was going to expire. And we had, as Melissa said, we had a number of conversations with Gene, with Melissa and others to say, we need to address this. And that is why we felt that pressure because uh, frankly, a number of us just started in the late summer of 2012. And it was after Act 10. And we said, we need to get this document in order in order to move forward, to provide some stability for the district and uh, for members and the entire district, frankly, not just members. So I hope that helps. Thanks. First, I, I want to thank everyone, right? Um, you know, knowing that we just ask, um, a lot of the union members with the the benefits. Um, I'm being very sensitive to this, right? And it is hard when you have a union and administration come to the board and there isn't complete agreement, right? So you know we're we're in this this moment, and I'm, I'm just trying to make sure that we we give it due consideration. Um, so if I look at these and I personally choose to take a position not to accept the administration's um, uh, recommendation of language changes. Uh, I want to know what that means. Uh, is there a counter proposal? Did you bring something to the conversation that was rejected that would be your position uh, on the language changes? Sure. And James, I'm going to defer back if you'd like it at some point. I think I'm seeing a lot of the board having questions on this particular part. And I think just we're kind of going into someone else's pond on this. And I think uh, just as an individual, I, I have a concern with it, um, with the specific language on there. And I think as a board, we can approve parts of it and ask them to rework it as opposed to the conversation taking place here. That's just my own opinion on it. So. I don't think anything's going to be worked out tonight. I think over yeah, with the, there's some further discussions and conversation. I I think we'll be able to, you know, in two weeks. Yeah. So yeah. yeah it's, I just want to make sure I understand. You're yeah. right. I maybe what we can discuss is you know if we're looking for more information. You know, um, you I think would agree with me that you've been very quiet. Right in in deference to the administration, and I, I I I need to know kind of what happens if I say no. Right, I I don't want to do this. Is there a way that there this gap can be bridged over the course of the next week? And 
Um, we know what the administration wants. I just don't know what anyone else wants come out there. And ultimately it is our decision. I don't want to participate in the creation of the language. I don't want to participate in the changes. I just, you know, I, I, I'm saying no or questioning a lot, but I don't know if, you know, the, the counter is completely absurd, right? And, and that's why we're here. Or if you're, if you're closer than I, I imagine you are. And, and so uh, yeah, if you want to respond or if we can gain access to a conversation over the next two weeks to help clarify, great. So I'd love to have the conversation during the next couple of weeks, please. Thank you. Okay, anything else? Sounds like there will be conversations that happen over the next couple of weeks and this will be brought forward to your regular board meeting. Okay, that concludes the operations committee. I gotta say that I really admire that conversation and all of you speaking your mind and keeping it, keeping it very civil. Yes, I, I really do appreciate that. So um, go ahead, Brian. And on that, you know, as was mentioned beforehand, there are so many just things that everyone agreed on, you know, and, and or discussions that had taken place. So to have two or three points, I think, goes to commend all of the parties that were involved on that, that it, you know, two or three things is a pretty small number as far as the number of changes that we are looking at on there, so. Yeah, yeah I just, um, I appreciate uh, the various union members who came tonight. I too grew up in a union household, a proud union household. Um, and I, these are things that uh, resonate with me. And I think it seems like the rest of the board feels the same way. So I'm hoping that we can find a way forward um, with so many willing people, it ought to be able to be done. So um, I guess I'll keep it at that. Um, that is our last agenda item. And with that, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. We are adjourned. Oh, sorry. <laughs> All in favor.